Rana Katero takes us on a tour of the Haganya detention facility and not fulfilling promised solutions. One senator calls for the termination of the pool contractor. Uh, good evening, Guam Gua, who's Chris Barnett in our top story. Just shy of one hour, Governor Lilian Guerrero delivered her second State of the Island address, which focused on her campaign platform, restoring faith in Guam's future, from health care to homeless, crime to commerce. The Magahaga unveiled her plans for the territory, and our Sabrina salas Matanani has more in our top story. In her second State of the Island address, Governor Lulian Guerrero announced several new initiatives. She also touted how the government's finances have been stabilized, maintaining her position that next month's minimum wage increase will go into effect. Despite the Guam Chamber of Commerce's numerous requests to implement a moratorium on the wage hike because of the economic impacts of the coronavirus. While we remain confident, my fiscal team is keeping a close watch on the situation preparing and monitoring the economic impacts of this new threat. But we know that minimum wage workers are not a part of that threat. The governor in the meantime announced that the primary focus of her policy team in the coming year is universal health coverage through a system of public self-insurance. It will require study, private sector ingenuity, and community courage. But together, we will get it done. And staying with health care, the governor says her administration is looking at several public and private financing options for a co-located new GMH and public health facility. This will take planning and the option we choose will be driven by our government's financial health. The amount that needs to be raised, our partnerships with the private sector and the comprehensiveness of the plan we propose. On crime, the governor urged the legislature to act on her Safer Guam initiatives, which was sent down in the form of several bills weeks ago. She also talked about efforts to combat Guam's drug problems, announcing that next month they will break ground on the first ever Women's Drug Addiction Center and plans for the GIVE program, Guam Immediate Violation Enforcement, which is a partnership between the Department of Corrections, Youth Affairs and the Judiciary. This program will launch in the coming weeks to immediately provide treatment in a prison setting to drug reoffenders breaking the change of addiction. The governor also announced that she is signing an executive order reviving an interagency council on homelessness, tasking relevant departments and divisions to coordinate services and resources that are most needed by the island's homeless population. She also pledged to work with Congressman Michael St. Nicholas on issues surrounding compact impact and H.R. 1365. Well, was it lip service or public service? Reaction to the governor's state of the island address from those she campaigned with and against. Here's more. Did the governor touch all the bases in her state of the island address? Well, that depends on who you ask. Where she was lacking was on public safety, public health, and public education. Uh, the three top uh, goals of any administration are those three. Former Senator Tony Atta ran against the governor with former Lieutenant Governor Ray Tenorio and lost. Speaker Tina Munya Barnes, on the other hand, has been one of the Magahaga's biggest allies in the legislature. She touched on all health, education, safety, protecting our children, returning funds to E911, to just adding new officers on the street, taking care of DOC. The governor said the Guam Economic Development Authority is looking at financing options for the ailing Guam Memorial Hospital, but Ada and Legislative Health Chair Senator Therese Terlahi said measures to help the hospital are being ignored by the administration, including a Terlahi bill giving $10 million to GMH. The governor not signing that bill, instead allowing it to lapse into law and saying it could not be implemented. The bills that I've put in and that have actually passed unanimously by the legislature, those need to be enforced. There's still a couple of bills that have been passed by this legislature to give the hospital an additional 10 to 20 million dollars. And I hope that she go ahead and fulfill that promise by giving the hospital what she needs. I do recall during the campaign season where if the hospital needs it, the hospital will get it. So let's hope that, you know, that she will keep that promise. Every day that things go unrepaired, we risk a, a bigger disaster. And so I just think the people of Guam deserve that. They don't deserve to wait anymore. Perhaps the biggest reveal in the governor's speech, she said she will make health care for all a reality on Guam, saying a hospital without insurance is like a boat on dry land. 
how is it going to get funded, and who is it going to be on the backs of, right? I mean, it, they're, they're going to pull the funding from uh, what health care they're giving out now, but what is it going to mean to the private sector? In closing her speech, the governor tasked Congressman Michael Nicholas to get Guam a seat at the table for the Federated States of Micronesia's compact renegotiation with the federal government. Speaker Barnes saying the feds should already know. We know that Uncle Sam still needs to come to the table and reimburse us for all the hard work that we continue to do. Governor Lulia Guerrero said her administration will work with Nicholas to bring home the compact impact reimbursement bacon. Meanwhile, former Governor Eddie Calvo says give credit where credit is due. The two-term Republican Magalahi telling KUAM he had some issues with the State of the Island address. Governor Lulia Guerrero's State of the Island address was themed restoring faith in Guam's future, but her predecessor, former Governor Eddie Calvo, says it should have been called something else. Rather than restoring faith, I would say continuing the faith. Because, you know, I, I, what I see a lot of positive in, in Governor Lulian uh, Lu speech is that she's building from the successes of, of uh, our administration. Calvo saying Governor Leon Guerrero took credit for ending federal receiverships at the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center and the Guam Solid Waste Authority. We have been pushing for the ending of the receivership for the landfill as well. So I, I do believe much, much if not all the progress occurred in the Calvo Tenorio administration. Calvo also raised concerns about the island's prison, saying he pulled it out from under a federal consent decree, but it may be headed back that way as several inmates have filed a complaint alleging inhumane conditions at DOC. I can tell you one thing, under our, our administration with folks such as uh, Joseph Augustine, Tony Lamarena, Kate Baldassar, uh, it was humane. And uh, obviously the federal uh, receiver and the courts agree. You can catch Cabo's full interview on our KUAM News Facebook page. In other news, the Attorney General has filed a complaint against the Consolidated Commission on Utilities for approving the $140,000 salary of the interim GWA general manager during a closed-door executive session back in 2015. The AG charges it was a violation of the open government law, which requires that discussions on salary or salary adjustments be conducted in open session. The complaint seeks to void the salary authorization and calls for repayment of all funds that were expended. The CCU held an open meeting last month seeking to comply with the open government law. It went back and re-voted on and approved previous salary decisions. Well, following a continued hearing on the inhumane conditions at the Agatnya lockup, all parties agreed to go to a site visit of the facility. KUAM's Adriana Cotera joins on the tour this afternoon, and here's a look inside the Agatnya lockup. So, um, but we have seen very significant progress, so that's good. But obviously some issues that need to be still followed up on. Federal Public Defender John Gorman says they are happy that sizable progress has been made and their complaints are being taken seriously. Although following today's on-site visit of the Alpha Block where his clients are detained, further concerns remain. This includes a fire suppression system, which is inoperable. It hasn't worked for several years. Yeah. Any idea when it will be fixed? Not at this time. <laughs> That's scary. Alpha Block has a total of 16 cells, each housing two detainees that ultimately allows for a capacity of 32 detainees, nine of which have filed a complaint and motion for a status hearing on the inhumane conditions at the Agania Detention Center. The Office of the Federal Public Defender filed a declaration that detailed the various unsafe, unsanitary concerns. According to court documents, these deficiencies are a result from a lack of supervision and resources from federal officials. Gorman told KUAM after obtaining the intergovernmental agreement, it clearly outlines the U.S. Marshals hold responsibility for the care and custody of the federal detainees, but they must work with the Department of Corrections, as these clients are in Alpha Block at the DOC facility. And before determining what legal course of action to take, the court and all parties involved are willing to work together to resolve the immediate issues. Since the first hearing two weeks ago, the U.S. Marshals and DOC have repaired physical needs, as noted on the visit. The main thing is, last time I think there were only four toilets working. Now we have 16. That's a huge difference. Um, and the showers, there were problems with the showers, so that's all fixed. The washers and dryers were, were down for a period of time, so... So, you know, improvements have definitely been made. As for the health concerns, the first stop on the tour was the medical room. According to Major Ogun, 
All inmates receive medical screenings upon entering DOC doors by Guam Memorial Hospital registered nurses assigned at the facility seven days a week from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. A medical doctor visits the center three days a week. The councils receive a briefing on the medical protocol when assessing patients. So every inmate is required to, after 14, within 14 days of being here, have a total medical evaluation. So some stay less, seven days, five days, and they're out, but those that do 14 and beyond, they're required to have a 14-day medical assessment where they have to see the doctor. It's required. Gorman says they are very concerned to not see any dental health treatments in place and feel that mental health is still an issue they plan to follow up on and continue to make the court aware of at the next status hearing set for March 9th. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Adriana Cotero. According to FBI agent Jason White, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Guam received a referral from the Guam Police Department concerning the Ipau Beach incident of Guam Police Officer Joey Uggen allegedly using excessive force during an arrest in December of last year. Agent White said based on the current fact pattern, the incident was referred back to GPD for resolution. He adds that if in the course of GPD's investigation, new information comes to light that suggests a violation of federal civil rights, the FBI will reevaluate. However, as we've reported, both GPD and the AG have closed their cases. Well, trial is set for October 15th for Take Care Insurance Company's civil case against Director of Administration Ed Byrne. Uh, both parties appeared in the district courtroom of Magistrates Judge Michael Berdadio this afternoon for a scheduling conference. The company's lawsuits stem from the new government health care con contract being awarded to Aetna International. Take Care argues that the recent Guam law is an unlawful delegation of authority to a private entity and prevented the company from participating in the health insurance procurement process. While trial is months away, multiple pretrial conferences are set throughout the year, and the initial PTC will be on April 2nd, and further hearings were set for July and September. Well, stick around for more news here on Prime Time. Stay tuned. You're watching KUAM. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now. It makes myself and it makes my team members very proud to work for an organization that has been on island for many years with its focus on reliability, dependability, and commitment to the communities that they operate in. Matson's a great corporate citizen to the community. We all benefit from any sort of environmental commitment we make. One of the ways that we do that is with our Adahi Utano program. There's action behind it, and so action breeds commitment. With the Kaimana Gila coming to Guam, this brings a new age and modernization to the island. It's exciting for me because it's a brand new ship and we can carry more freight into the islands. It just shows growth for Guam and Micronesia. Matson would be nothing without its customers and we hope to continue to serve you for decades to come. I'm in the club. Half a day, welcome to Two Lovers Point. Half a day, I'm in the club. Green Energy Solutions, Inc. would like to congratulate GU Self Storage along with Calvo Enterprises in doing their part by going green with a monthly power reduction by over 80%. Power consumption before installation was 39,700 kilowatt hours. After installation ended in 6,221 kilowatt hours, which resulted in savings over $10,000 a month. GESI also offers LED lights, solar thermal VRF air conditioning, and solar photovoltaics. Visit our website and let us help you save. It's a special delivery to your inbox every week with your KUAM News Roundup, program advisories, and promotions. Sign up for the weekly KUAM Digital Digest today on KUAM.com. Welcome back. The number of new coronavirus cases in South Korea has spiked to more than 600, and it is now the most number of infections outside of China. The government has placed the country under its highest alert level, and the resulting drop in outbound travel is taking a huge toll on tourist arrivals to Guam. Nestor Lecanto reports. Tourism officials were expecting more than 70,000 arrivals from Korea this month, but coronavirus-related cancellations have dropped that number to only about 43,000. 
Korea Guam Travel Association President Terry Chung. They are just afraid of a travel. Uh, people are afraid to go to a crowded area, closed and crowded area, such as an airport, uh, church, department store, retail. He says the 40-member strong KGTA was projecting another record year for Korean arrivals, but that may no longer be possible. The virus issue has to settle down. Unless this issue is settled down, uh, it's very, it will be very hard to increase the uh, level from Korea. The global travel slowdown is already hitting many markets hard. Jung says Guam bookings are way down and the KGTA is feeling the pinch. Especially uh, local travel agents, they are suffering right now and they are cutting down the cost and they are also uh, reducing some of their manpower. Uh, for example, uh, majority of uh, travel agents started a uh, uh, vacation without pay. For now, they'll have to wait until travelers regain confidence and hopefully they'll have some pent-up vacation money to spend on markets like Guam. We will work hard uh, with the uh, GBB to bring the tourists back to the island. GBB is planning uh, for the recovery plan and if they need our support, we will fully support on their activity. The Korean market may be down for now, but Chung believes it's certainly not out. As long as virus issues settle down, I am very optimistic. For Guam's News Network, I'm Nestor Lekanto. Adelub issued a joint news release saying authorities are monitoring regional COVID-19 developments, but Guam still has no confirmed cases nor any patients under investigation for the virus. Well, it looks like H.R. 1365 won't be passing the House of Representatives this week as a House schedule obtained by KUAM News doesn't show the bill is on the House agenda. Delegate Michael Sinicholas's technical corrections bill fixes a problem with the Guam World War II Loyalty Recognition Act to begin a federal process for paying war claims with Guam's Section 30 money. The measure was passed by the Senate on Valentine's Day, but since the Senate amended it, it must pass another House vote before it's sent to President Trump to sign or veto the House. Scheduled to vote on 13 bills this week with voting happening Wednesday and Thursday. Guam Times, St. Nicholas Head said the passage of a local war claims law would damage 1365's chances of passing. Well, despite having been in constant contact with the Department of Parks and Recreation and the pool contractor for weeks, many of the proposed and promised solutions for the Dedito pool have not been implemented. Joan Ogan Charfers has more on the call for termination of the pool contract after the closure of the Dedito pool just a week after it reopened. Citing poor maintenance of Guam's two public pools, Committee Chair Senator Kelly Marsh Titano is calling for Department of Parks and Recreation to terminate its contract with Canton Construction Corp. In a letter to DPR Director Richie Banez, she says that DPR must hold the contractor accountable in keeping the pool open and safe. It was during the February 7th oversight hearing that many from the swimming community spoke out about the contractor. Chris Duenas, DPR board member, and Ed Ching, Guam Swimming Federation president. If he is unable to repair the pool at which he was granted that funding to repair the pool, nor is he relevant enough to operate it, then I think that we need to find a new maintenance and a new source. It's not a source of funding. It's a new pump. It's a new pump, and we need someone new to install that. I think Canton has did a disservice to everyone here who is a taxpayer. A two-year contract at several thousand dollars a month and the pool is not in operation, I think they owe us some money. In my opinion, the contractor doesn't know what he's doing. It's a construction contractor. Does he really know how to run the pool? They said they're certified? I don't know. According to Marsh Titano, DPR's only certified pool expert was reassigned last October by the administration to Department of Public Works. In a letter, she urges that they immediately return to DPR, adding that the reoccurring closure of the pool does not encourage the public confidence in DPR's abilities to manage the pools. Concerned citizen Fred Black and Frank Flores, swim team parent. Why did we have one contractor? Why did the one key employee in public in, in the Parks and Recs that was related to the contractor, why has he suddenly been transferred? Fire this contractor and determine if there's some inappropriate relationship between the contractor, somebody in the department, somebody in the government. And we need to see if this contractor is still being paid even if the pool's close. That's unacceptable. 
On Monday, the Division of Environmental Health inspected the Dededo pool, and in an assessment report, it was noted the pool will remain closed until imminent health hazards are addressed and approval from public health is obtained. Marsh Titano closes out her letter to Ibanez with stern direction, saying, quote, make no mistake, neither the legislature or the public is satisfied with DPR's performance or explanations regarding its management of the pools. It is therefore incumbent upon you to take immediate action to resolve this matter and open the pools, end quote. Reporting for Guam's News Network, I'm Jonah Gancharfras. A continuation of the oversight hearing is this Friday at 5.15 p.m. Marsh Titano has instructed DPR to ensure the contractor is in attendance because the public deserves answers, she says. Three candidates have turned in their paperwork for the Jotnia Mayor's special election. Guam Election Commission Director Maria Pangalina tells KUAM Democrats Cedric Diaz and Bill Kenga and Republican Kiko Hyten have all filed to run in the March 28th special election, the deadline to file for that election. Thursday, 5 p.m., an official ratification of mayoral candidates will take place at the GEC board meeting on Friday night. Ratified candidates draw for ballot placement on Friday. The special election will fill the void left by former Mayor Jesse Blas, who resigned after being jailed following his indictment for months on extortion and bribery charges. Polls will be open March 28th from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. And on special election day, ballot counting should be done by 11. The GEC must allow a 10-day window for absentee ballots to come in before certification of special election results. Well, sports is next. Keep it here.